Hello and welcome to Dinish Guarda YouTube podcast series powered by openbusinesscouncil.org, citiesabc.com and fashionabc.org and fashion and uh, sportsabc.org. We are here trying to portray once again the global leaders and personalities that are pushing boundaries of technology, innovation and business and special people that I found uh, on the bridge of creating new innovation, new strategies that actually can take us forward in the areas of uh, fourth industry revolution, Web3, metaverse, and a lot of different areas and topics that are key for us. And uh, what we've been doing right now is really uh, trying always to push the boundaries about different personalities that are actually creating new solutions and actually can actually help us understand the uh, um, new ways of looking at the way we portray ourselves in technology, the way we handle different areas. So for our series today, I welcome uh, Kendrick Wong, co-founder and chairman of LiquidX and the serial entrepreneur. So Kendrick is difficult, difficult to put on the box because he's still a quite young entrepreneur, but he's been doing fantastic things and achieving really quite uh, uh, amazing um, achievements in a lot of different areas. So uh, Kendrick was born in a family of entrepreneurs with startup experience across Europe and Southeast Asia. And it was featured in Forbes 2019 Asia in 30 under 30. And he's a technology expert and entrepreneur who has extensive startup experience and as well has been working in the bridge between technologies, um, the most cutting edge technologies from uh, uh, Python for, for scripting to native iOS, Python and a lot of different areas of, uh, of uh, native Android and Parse and ASP.NET and so forth in terms of the technology. But he's as well a founder and a serial entrepreneur that has been building companies. Uh, in the past, he created companies like Scorpion Textiles and Wholesale and Shopper to multi-million dollars valuations. And uh, as well, he built the Omnalytics, a fashion analytics platform that offers real-time market intelligence data across 75,000 brands. And uh, he's been uh, in this first venture that he created, uh, became a quite substantial platform for entrepreneurs, SMEs and global business, including brands like Adidas and Ferragamo. And at the moment, uh, uh, he's leading and is a co-founder and chairman of LiquidX, a Web3 venture capital studio for the metaverse. Um, where Kendrick progresses in his mission to provide infrastructure for the entry and the exploration of a ever-growing industry for through proprietary anime marketplace. And part of that work as well is create a, a, a strong Web3 metaverse ecosystem. LiquidX recently acquired Anime Metaverse, a publishing and licensing company focused on building anime, manga, and drama in Web3. And uh, Kendrick co-runs a private equity firm, Weatherall Investment, and invests in startups, venture capital funds, and blockchain companies within Southeast Asia. And uh, of course, part of his work is looking at uh, how we can actually push the boundaries in all these different things. So I'm looking forward to talk with you, Kendrick. Welcome to our series. Thanks, Denise. Thanks a lot for this. Glad to be here. So Kendrick, I, I go directly to the point. So as someone that is quite young, but super entrepreneurial. So um, I think as, as you highlighted in your bio, you have as well a family entrepreneurial background. So how did you come back and how did you actually build this career with super entrepreneurial uh, energy, but as well building fantastic things? So can you tell us a bit about your history? How do you come back? How do you start your first venture? How do you start building companies and technology? Yeah, so... Um... I think maybe the first uh, thing I should go through is that um, entrepreneurship uh, is is it is born is usually born out of desperation more than anything else. So it's like for example, my family um, they were entrepreneurs not because they wanted to, but because they were forced into that kind of situation, whereby we just wanted to make a, a living, and it's a lot of like trial and error, a lot of uh, hard work. Um, initially, in my I used to glorify it as well. I used to think that uh, being an entrepreneur means I don't have to work a nine to five job. And I realized that is true to some extent because you're working 24 seven. So you manage to exit the nine to five pace, but you're, but you're having to work extra hours in that case. Um, for myself personally, the reason why I went into entrepreneurship was for a very similar reason as my parents. Uh, basically I was in a uni, uh, I had to pay my way through uni myself, pay my own rent, pay my own fees. And uh, I just needed money. I couldn't pay my rent. Uh, it got to a point whereby my bank account was like close to zero. So I started finding all kinds of ways to basically get started, to do some small trading on the side. 
uh, and trading in the sense of like physical good trading, not like um, uh, crypto trading or anything along the lines of those. Uh, basically, I would wake up at like three in the morning, buy the mobile phones from let's say the blue collar workers, and then go to sleep and wake up at seven a.m. to sell it to the white collar workers before they go to work. And in that like arbitrage, you can make like fifty dollars to sixty dollars if you're lucky. And that's basically just genesis of everything. From there, I just started growing and growing and growing into different kinds of businesses. Well, wow, that's impressive. And, and so tell us a bit, uh, I don't know if you want to share with us. So I know that um, our audience is quite global, but of course, living in, in, in Singapore in Southeast Asia is very different from living in London, in Africa, or in Japan, or in the, even in the US. So what do you see that the treats of uh, the cultural background that you came for? So I think one of the things I, I see, especially in Singapore, is that people are very hardworking and very dedicated to uh, finding a problem, finding a solution to that, to, to, to the solution to the problem. So do you think that kind of cultural background was important for you or was just out of your energy and out of your understanding of taking things forward? I, I never really fit into that, uh, into the education system. Um, uh, and, um, and I always used to try to find ways to get out of it. So I had to be creative in how I would, for example, skip school without my parents, uh, finding out. So I think that trying trying to like, play against the rules, trying to play a lot of uh, online games at the point when I was younger, allowed me to think more creatively, uh, which is basically how you then approach a, a problem. Usually a problem is about creative solution, right? And entrepreneurship is about how many problems can you solve. And then once you stop figuring out how to solve the problems, your business starts declining. So I think to me, the biggest inspiration behind uh, problem solving is actually playing uh, online games. Because in online games, you had to, I mean, work party across uh, multiple different groups of people across multiple different time zones and figure out how to work with different cultures and different ethnicities okay very very interesting on that level so that means your energy and so forth so in terms of your career can you tell us a bit about your history um, the first venture the first breakthrough if you want to share with our audience and as well where we are right now with liquid x and what is liquid x so um we we, we had a few different things with i tried at the start the first one was that that took off was um, we basically created a wholesale business whereby we would buy and sell uh, goods between China and Europe. And this was like before Alibaba became quite popular. So there was a huge arbitrage in terms of the opportunity. Um, that business took off and that was basically how we made our first um, like stack of uh, cash that we could then invest into new businesses. Liquid X in particular uh, is entirely different. So Liquid X focuses entirely on um, Web3, or basically building infrastructure for Web3. Uh, and within that, uh, at the moment, we're focusing on two things in particular. Uh, we have gaming as well as intellectual property. But we're also looking to build out other uh, infrastructure work. Liquid X has three things. We do investments, we do acquisitions, and we do uh, and we venture build our own companies. Um, so on that front, um, it's a business I've never been into before, uh, especially on the venture building aspect because it requires an entirely different kind of skill set from basically building your own companies and working it from day one to, to grow it and eventually selling it. Uh, I am quite fortunate uh, that in Liquid X, um, the partners here are like uh, extremely good and they are very, uh, and they complement uh, my skill set a lot because I like to go very big picture and very quick. Another partner um, is very much more centered and he basically drives all the revenue within the business. And so we like to joke that I like to spend the money, he makes the money. Okay, very straightforward. <laughs> Sorry, I like that. So just, just coming back to Liquid X. So uh, what you guys are doing is really quite impressive, uh, combining a lot of different things. So from the combination and the different, different areas, because you're doing quite a lot of stuff, can you just highlight for people that don't know anything about Liquid X, how does it work? How people can get involved and the different products and solutions you guys are building right now? Yeah, so Liquid X is more of a holding company uh, that encapsulates um, what we have within it. So we've done two acquisitions, for example, in the past 12 months. The first being a company called Pixelmon, and that's a game five project. They say um, we, that project raised $70 million uh, and there were some challenges with the management team. So we came in and did a full acquisition of it and bought 60% of the company and took what control, operation control, um, basically treasury control, everything behind it uh, for that. Uh, we've seen grown the company from a team of one person who did the acquisition to a team of about 70 people at this point in time. And the goal behind that is to build up um, one AAA game, which is basically 
an open world uh, game where you capture monsters, as well as a PvP arena where you're able to battle uh, each other uh, based upon the monsters you capture. The second company we ended up acquiring last year was a company called Anime Metaverse. And that's the one that I also uh, lead as a CEO at this point in time. For Anime Metaverse, um, it's an IP publishing company. So we do two things. We produce and we license IP. Today, we're the only international anime producer in the world, which means that outside of us, um, there is no one else producing original anime in Japan with a top-tier anime studio. And we've done one deal so far. Um, it's called Special Kit Factory. But we are in the process of doing a few more deals as well. Very impressive. So um, in terms of the, the anime metaverse, um, so the way it works, for instance, one of the products is the Alpha Solos. And they have uh, different games and different parts. So can you explain how it works? Because, if, for instance, you have the Soulmate kind of experience with the Alpha Solos. You have the Webtoons, a Gallery, Chronicles and different things. So a bit of product uh, top level overview and of course I, I suggest our audience to go to anima metaverse.ai because that's really a cool a cool solution and a, a great uh, game and as well an NFT integration with OpenSea and looks rare. So uh, anime metaverse we're going through the rebranding process at this point in time. Uh, basically anime metaverse uh, when we acquired the company uh, it was one we wanted to build a metaverse which is hence a name behind it uh, for multiple different anime characters. During the acquisition process, um, we ended up refocusing the efforts on the production side. So um, production means that if you if you take into account, let's say from a Hollywood film, right? What a producer does is that a producer may just the start of the end process of basically creating a great, let's say, movie. Um, you find the team, you bring the team in, you finance it, you distribute it, everything. Uh, same thing, same thing for us in the anime industry. Um, we started producing anime, uh, as well as licensing very popular anime series. So Anime Metaverse became uh, the holding company of the group as well uh, within the anime ecosystem. And then we have the B2C arm, which is called Kasagi. So Kasagi uh, is focused on uh, basically monetizing the IPs that we hold as well as distributing um, the anime that we're producing. Anime is a very interesting industry. Uh, if you look towards, let's say, the top 10 IPs in the world, uh, four of the six top 10 is actually Japanese. Uh, three of the top six is Japanese. But the biggest struggle within that is usually that uh, Japanese IP struggles uh, sometimes to expand globally uh, because distribution globally is a bit of a challenge. So what we realized that we have an advantage in is that uh, we have very good contacts in the Japanese industry, uh, which gets us access to this kind of IP licensing deals as well original productions that we want to expand globally for that. So the soulmates that you see over there, the supernova characters that you see, um, which, is an, which is our NFTs, those are basically access points into our ecosystem. So holding those kind of NFTs allows you to basically get access into the IPs that we are uh, licensing into the anime that we are producing. And eventually these characters will also be utilized within um, the anime that we are producing as well. Really uh, super impressive. So the anime industry and market size is around $28 billion in 2022 and is expected to, to reach uh, $31 billion this year. Uh, so from the products that you've been building and the audiences, um, how do you make the bridge between Web 2 and Web 3? Because you are touching NFTs, you're touching gaming, and you're touching as well different audiences. So how do you look at this bridge between the anime, because of course it's one of the most dynamic industries, as you mentioned? So um, one of the biggest challenges is that uh, you can't... So, I mean, in the early days, right, we tried to force... Um, a Web 2 brand to Web 3 or force a Web 3 brand to Web 2. And I don't think that works. The challenges there is that uh, there is a core audience base uh, that already understands the nuances of the IP. And making a big change like that can disrupt the community and the fan base, which you don't want to do. So instead, the approach we're taking is that we are selling, um, we are licensing very strong IPs, those as very globally renowned. Uh, example, because, uh, one is Zero Experiment Lane, which is a cult um iconic anime in japan and we are starting to sell merchandise around this so the merchandise is tied towards um nfts that is basically token backed so as you buy a physical good you get an nft is attached to it so slowly we're able to bring a few audiences from web 2 into web 3 and then bring them to have an experience within web 3 that they enjoy and that they stay there so that's basically the bridge between the web 2 and the web 3 components but i do think that all of this is very new and very nascent. So there'll be a lot of changes that are going to happen along the way. 
I think today at least um, the route towards it is uh, having a connection between the physical items because one of the biggest challenges is that when I want to look at my NFT collection, right, which is entirely digital based, there is no connection to it into the physical uh, world, which means that my physical time and my digital time is separated, which I think should be joined together. That's a very interesting thing, actually. I, I'm looking at, um, as we speak, I am preparing for the interview, I look at the different markets. And like you said, there's a huge network of companies. Uh, around 25% of the the revenue share is coming from Southeast Asia and China and, and all Asia. But the market is growing worldwide. And I think what you touched between the physical and the digital is the key element. So what audiences are you targeting with the anime um, platform? And how do you see the industry going, especially because you're touching as well metaverse? So in, the, in this case, it's more for the NFTs, but you're trying to create as well immersive experiences that touch augmented reality with VR and AR. What's your goal and how you see the industry going, especially as a creator and as a tech, a tech uh, personality? So the, the markets we're going after will be uh, US, Middle East, Europe and Southeast Asia. I think these are markets that are growing very quickly. Interestingly, the Middle East is one of the uh, larger markets for anime uh, consumption today, but it's also one of the most underrepresented markets, which I think um, will change in the next few years. In terms of um, how we are approaching it, it is very largely driven by the licensing deal as well as the original productions. Because when you produce original anime, right, you get to design the story plot with the studio that you work with. And if you can design something that is inherently Japanese still, but also ha touches upon the cultural differences in the countries we want to work with, then I think you can produce something quite unique. There was one uh, producer that I spoke with recently that had this like marvelous idea. He, he, he spoke uh, in depth around how um, in Japan or Japanese animation today, um, a lot of it uh, is inspired by things that the producers have grown up watching or grown up living, but uh, rarely have they produced anime uh, based upon the lives of people overseas. So he wants to experiment with that as well. Uh, other things he want to experiment with are things like, can he create a sign language anime production? So I, I thought this kind of like interesting thoughts and ideas that they're bringing uh, is something that we can also um, further like, think about as we start producing more and more anime. And do you think that, uh, especially right now, for the young generations, one of the things I realize is that, uh, for instance, if you look at uh, most of the, at least in terms of benchmarks, uh, the number of views, especially for metaverse direct platforms like Roblox Direct, is around 1 billion people per month. If you look at Roblox alone, probably getting 50% or 60% of the market. This kind of immersive experience and platforms are going to be growing massive. But I think the challenge is that how we can actually get a lot of this immersive experience with AR, VR, with the licenses and all the things, the web too, and as well with innovation that comes out of the metaverse. Um, so I you see the innovation part of the metaverse included in the anime world and market, but as well with the young audiences that you're targeting? I think that um, even before thinking about things like the metaverses, right, I think that there's a lot of these kind of things that existed for a long time. Uh, whether I think that you think look towards games, right? Like Fortnite, Maple Story, um, Minecraft, these kind of like experiences are basically similar to Roblox that you have today. And they're like much more advanced versions than even some of the metaverses or most metaverses that you actually see that call as a metaverses at least today. Uh, these, these are just immersive experiences in their own right. The difference between that and the metaverse, um, I guess, is the economy that should be created. Uh, a game is like is an internal economy, right? And a metaverse is meant to be an external economy whereby whatever you do there can be translated to something of uh, fiat value. In terms of how do we bring AM to that state, um, at this point, I'm not sure yet, but this one, I think Liquid X is more, uh, is more advanced in that. So Liquid X, in this case, they are building, we want to build a lot of infrastructure uh, companies. And what we are particularly interested in is finding like entrepreneurs with this kind of vision. Because we know that as an individual, right, we have a limitation in uh, how many ideas or what we can execute upon. So instead of just executing upon ourselves and our own ideas, we are trying to partner with very uh, aspiring entrepreneurs that maybe need a little boost in terms of tokenomic design, in terms of like development, in terms of aspiring partner. And instead of that, we 
we fund them for them to grow their own uh, next venture. And we think this is a way to solve the next frontier instead of doing everything ourselves. Uh, so let, let's talk about that um, that way. For, for instance, on the Liquid X studio companies, you have Anime Metaverse, which we touch a bit. You have Pixel Moon. And we have a portfolio of companies that comprehend really, it's quite substantial. So from the capital portfolio like Gomu, uh, Mythical Protocol, Sekai, Avion, Ashid, uh, Animoco Brands, which of course is massive, even Coinbase Ventures, Defiance. So it's quite a big market in terms of the, the gaming Web3 version. So how do you see this market going and how do you interact with this? You work this more through the token tokenomics and, and, and relationship with these brands or as well as an investment in building an ecosystem of players that actually can uh, create utility between them and playing between the different platforms. Like you said, each game is actually a marketplace in its own. So how do you see this and how do you see this in the in the in the principle in the perspective of Liquid X and as well the the um, anime, uh, especially the areas of uh, anime metaverse? So there was a mistake that you mentioned just now, which is that um so there there's some popular companies that's correct. But I think you also reference our co-investors and not our portfolio companies. So companies okay, like Coinbase yeah, Ventures and Defiance. Because it appears as capital portfolio. So they are partners. Okay, I understand. No, they, they are entirely separated. Those are not portfolio. They are partners. Um, okay. So we just want to get, to make that separation very clear. Um, we we see it in two ways. One is that we do investments naturally uh, in companies that we that we like, that we think that we have a, a synergistic to liquid X portfolio companies. But on the other side, um, we are also uh, backing at the very first stage uh, entrepreneurs, which is trying to figure out the ideas and what ideas that they want to create. So we're very agnostic in terms of the ideas because we don't want to tell the entrepreneur what to create. But instead, we want to find an entrepreneur that with a great idea already and we want to back them. So we want to ensure that they have the highest chance of success. Um, so we are first check in and we want to be the last check out as well. So that's basically the difference between the two. Um, that and any metaverse is totally separated in that case, because um, any metaverse focuses entirely around the, the production and licensing of anime IP. Um, but Liquid X is focusing around uh, how do we enable the next level of growth for the Web3 ecosystem, uh, both uh, from an infrastructure point of view as well as from uh, the intellectual property point of view. So we have uh, the Liquid X capital portfolio just to rectify is open. Um, uh, Avium, Gomu, and Mythical Protocol and Sekai. This is the product is the capital portfolio, and then the invest uh, Liquid X um, invest along the other partners. There is Season Capital, Ashed, Animoca Brands, Coinbase Ventures, Defiance Capital, Mirana, Quest Ventures, and that Mile. Uh, just to ratify this correct, I think it's an yeah. important one. That's so correct. coming back to to the bridge between so one of the things that are right now and i would like for you to explain this for our audience as well um so in terms of the the state-of-the-art parts of the web 3 and metaverse is 3d design animation and game development associated to the tokenomics smart contract develops and staking so let's look at these two things because i think there's a lot of myths around this and unless you are very into crypto like probably you and me and uh, people like us there's a big uh, challenge how to understand how tokenomics can reward uh, users and companies because of course unless you trade uh, in binance or this kind of big crypto platforms or or mention we mentioned coinbase and so forth the tokenomics around gaming are still very uh, new okay even for instance roblox as a, as its own point system but it's not tokenomics it's an internal point system and for instance we have the central end and a lot of others the fortnite and so forth that have different parts but in terms of mainstream tokenomics and and the especially crypto areas we still don't have probably the exception of nfts a very strong um i would say user experience and user uh, adoption uh, because let's say if you look at the active users of nfts is around three four million people worldwide um I'm talking active users and the ones that are really doing more at transactions and much is a fraction of that so how do you see this part of the the design, animation, game development with the tokenomics in particular? So um, tokenomics, if you break it down, is uh, simply an economics model. It's, you can liken it to like the monetary system around the world, right? Uh, every country has its own monetary system. Every uh, economy will have its own tokenomics uh, for a, a game, a metaverse, 
or protocol, whatever you want to to figure out, use it for. It, it's basically like um, an incentive uh, mechanism that you build to incentivize a user to do certain action points that benefits both themselves as well as the uh, larger company as a whole. So I think that's the simplest way to uh, explain like tokenomics. Um, everything else that comes other than outside of that, whether it's staking, uh, whether it's like, animation, those are supplementary points that benefits the main uh, components. Uh, the, main, the main objective, which is basically building a better self-sustaining economy um, that allows the user, that, that enables the user to have a better experience within the ecosystem. So that's basically how I would, I would likely do it. Um, how animation or sticking comes to play, I think that one is like, uh, depends around uh, the technology design that we, that we do it itself. And that one is very fluid. I mean, for Pixamon, which is a portfolio company of Liquid X as well, um, the, the way they're doing it is very unique. Uh, crypto comics wise is centered around uh, the NFTs that you hold. So there's a list, there's 10,005 NFTs that have been released already across 69 different uh, Pixelmon characters. And those um, NFTs basically represents uh, like your um, access into the game of whenever you make any purchases on skins or any if you compete against any of these characters, you get a small uh, benefit um, accrued towards you based upon what you are fighting within the game itself. So there's a lot of different ways that you can then extrapolate that, right? For example, you can then say, if you find, if you hold, let's say, Monster A and you find Monster A in the game, maybe what you then get is that you get an additional token uh, or special token because you found the NFT of the monster that you're competing against. But the reverse can also be true, which is that I can say that if you find monster A in the game and you beat monster A, you have to get nothing because you shouldn't be competing against the monsters that you currently hold. So, I mean, that's an example of, like, of how you can think about this kind of tokenomics, right? You can design any system you want, but the system should always have the best interest of the consumer, of your players, as well as the economy as a whole together. No, that's very, it's it's really a, uh, the way, well, we're going to see the next iteration of uh, the, the internet and as well the Web3 metaverse. But I, I think there's still a lot of work to bring a lot of users to this. So one of the things I want to touch as well, so it's especially the way the gaming community uses Discord and, uh, and Twitter and different parts, and especially how we integrate the Discord community that is fast growing with the gaming um and uh, especially the 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 web three. So uh, one of the things I know that you have a quite substantial community management on Discord. So can you tell us how do you leverage Discord with the uh, web three and with all the tokenomics parts? If you want to touch a bit on this. So uh, Discord and uh, tokenomics are separated, but um, the reason why we use Discord is because it's a great community management tool. So it allows us to uh, communicate with our community um, in real time and rapidly. A large part about Web3, right, is about transparency and building the open. So every time uh, we want to get feedback um, or we want to talk to our community, we ask for the feedback within the group itself, within the Discord group itself. So I'll give you an example there. Um, our Pixelmons can evolve. So you have, let's say, Evolution 1, Evolution 2, the like of those. As they evolve, we submit the concept designs into our Discord so that they're able to then um, vote on what kind of concept they like more or give us feedback to why they don't like certain concepts as well. well thank you so much. And it's uh, an interesting, I want to touch these different things. So uh, let's look right now in terms of the way you work with your anime char characters on OpenSea. I would like uh, to explain, especially for you to explain to our audience, because uh, for instance, I'm, I'm right now in terms of the anime, for instance, I just opened an open sea anime metaverse soulmates, which of course is one of your uh, characters, and you have an entire um, a system of NFTs around this. So at the moment, the price is around the uh, um, you have two thousand three hundred forty two items of uh, of anime. Um, just in the case of the soulmates, um, so from your audience, uh, uh, if you could work on the user flow, because a lot of these things, of course, you and me are into this. But I, I'm trying to demystify these things for people that are outside of this world, which has a lot of people, and as well to get new audience to this. So 
how do you go from the open sea experience like the, a user journey from someone that buys an nft on soulmates and becomes part of um, part of the anime metaverse so um nfts are simply a medium of uh, exchange right so basically you can create any nft and assign different values towards those nfts uh, in our case our nfts are access points into manga and the anime industry in Japan because whenever we do any partnerships with any of the manga or anime IPs we always ensure to give exclusive drops towards our holders so um, we like to create our audience so that it's focused very much around um, the anime uh, fans or what they call themselves as weeks in terms of how do you purchase it at the moment you can only purchase it using Ethereum but we'll also be releasing collections whereby you can purchase it using credit cards and fiat uh, USD in this case. So there's always an iteration around that. So, so for instance, if you look at, the, like you said, in the case of uh, anime metaverse, and uh, Flip, I think you're taking notes on this. We still record, so just take notes. So I'll start the question. So on the um, in in part of your narrative of the anime uh, anime metaverse dot AI is that you have the webtoons, you have the NFTs which webtoons is for you can actually see the, the cartoons and then engage with the cartoons and then you have the NFT and then you are starting to do a kind of other in, initiatives more in, in immersive. Are you thinking about creating your own um, metaverse interactive game that relates all of this together or for now we're making the 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 webtoons with the gallery of nfts and different parts so what's your goal for the future to expand the anime metaverse so uh we don't plan building a metaverse or a game just yet at least not in the next three years because we think that there are other companies out there that can do it better than us and uh it's just not within our skill set uh pixelmon on the other hand is different so pixelmon is building something like that so the other uh, point um, that we may expand with is that we may just utilize Pixelmon's uh, metaverse instead of building our own. Um, in terms of what we want to do more of, we want to produce more original IPs and we want to license more existing anime content. Oh, very good. So, and and uh, just to wrap up, and I, I know that uh, you're quite uh, doing a lot of stuff. So from LiquidX, um, what's your goal right now? So you have a quite substantial portfolio. How do you see the growth of LiquidX? and anime um, metaverse as well. So how you think the next, let's say, two, three years, how you want to continue expanding both LiquidX and anime metaverse? Yeah, so um, LiquidX is run by a different team from me. So operationally, I'm not involved in LiquidX. I sit only on the board of directors. Um, but LiquidX's goal is to find more entrepreneurs that we can back at the early stage for us to produce uh, very high quality um, companies uh, and that only comes when you back the right entrepreneur. So on the investment front, we're looking to do more investments, but on the venture building front, we're only likely to do like two venture building companies uh, per year where we work very closely with the founders to build that out. Um, on anime metaverse, the growth path or the way we want to end up is that we want to co-own the largest collection of anime IPs in the world. Okay, fantastic. So, and just uh, one last question. So in terms of uh, the ticket investment for and for people listening to us, uh, for LiquidX, I know that you're not in the operations, but you're still part of the board. How do you look at this kind of investors and companies you're looking for? And as well, how you want to expand the uh, anime metaverse? So two questions, sorry, on that last one. So we typically do like 100k USD investments to 250k. Um, the companies that we look for, so in the early, very early stages, um, it's all about the team as well as the market share, uh, market size, because... If the team is good and the market size is big enough, it allows you to pivot into something else. And it's very rarely that you find a team that you invest in that uh, doesn't change the idea along the way. Because the idea of iteration, right, is that you have to keep improving your idea as you collect more and more data points. So that's basically how we look into the whole space. Fantastic. No, I appreciate uh, your time. I know that uh, you uh, you are quite busy. So uh, it's been a, a, an, honor, an honor, a privilege, Kendrick. I wish you all the luck for the different things. We're going to highlight all the different things for people listening to us. Um, last thing, where people can find you, how people can engage with you, with your platforms. Of course, we'll put all the links, but coming from you is always a good one. Uh, they can uh, message us on uh, LinkedIn or the website. That's usually the best place to find us. 
uh, we rarely attend events. Um, so the usually the best thing is just through referrals or through our websites. Fantastic. So thank you so much. Good luck for you thank and you. continue doing these fantastic, amazing things. Thank you. Right, thank you. Thanks for this. See you guys. Okay. Cheers.